if my words did glow with the gold of sunshine and my tunes were played on the harp of the strum would you hear my voice come through the music would you hold it Hello everyone, this is Chuck Clough from Above the Basement, Boston Music and Conversation. Meet Mickey Hart, part philosopher, scientist, shaman, and passionate drummer. Mickey and the Grateful Dead have offered up the groove and the melody for some of the most iconic themes of our generation. Mickey is a musicologist, a student of polyrhythms, and a believer in the connections we all have to rhythm. He has two Grammys and has collaborated with a Nobel Prize in Physics winner, stem cell researchers, and neuroscientists, including the late, great Oliver Sacks. Mickey is a true supporter of music therapy and the mechanisms behind the healing power of music for not only the injured or neurologically changed, but for the well-being of people from all cultures. In 1967, he was introduced to the newly formed Grateful Dead by drummer Bill Kreutzmann, and the big bang of the jam band was formed with Mr. Jerry Garcia at the helm. His telepathic relationship on and off the stage with band members old and new has transcended decades, leading Mickey to the latest chapter, bringing three generations of fans together for this year's tour with Dead and Company. This is part two of our conversation with Mickey Hart, recorded at his hotel, in Boston, Massachusetts. For years, you recorded song- sounds in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, my first recording, I failed. It was me and Bob Weir. Bob thought it would be a great idea, it was a 67, I think, to go out to the... To the uh, this is how my career started. I don't think I ever really talked about it. He said, let's record the animals of the full moon at the, at the zoo. I thought, wow, that's a great idea. <laughs> I'm in. So, so I grabbed uh, a sound guy, was a, a man was named Owsley, and he was a, a recordist. He was a fantastic recordist. And he also made incredible LSD. <laughs> and I grabbed his machine, and we went out to the, <laughs> to the zoo, and he gave me 40 feet of mic line for a two-foot job. So I got the mic line caught on the, uh, on the gate, and of course... The guards came, we were on the inside, and we were laughing so hard. As they always come. Of course, we, we were of an altered consciousness at that particular moment, I believe. What year is this? 67. 67. And they escorted us nicely out. And uh, that was my first out of hundreds of remote recordings. And it was the only recording that I failed to bring back any to sound. Bring back. The first one. But that was the first. And the animals were absolutely silent. There was no, on the full moon, they don't howl like Bob says. So there wasn't. <laughs> right. He was very kid. We lived together, you know, we did a lot of things together. <laughs> right. That'd be one of them. I'll never forgive him for that. <laughs> so it actually was never recorded. It's a recording that was never recorded. recorded. I, didn't, I didn't roll tape that day. It was the only day in all my life, in all my career, of remote recordings that I didn't roll tape. You've always had an interest in this, obviously, but it's in recent years that it's been more of a scientific mm, passion, right? How do you, do you think about that while you're playing? Do, do you have a different way about you with these tours if you compare to when you, you weren't working on it as a scientific construct? You know, I could put it all more in context now. When I'm, I don't think of anything when I'm playing. I try to empty my, my vessel. When I go on stage, I'm blank. I don't think of anything. That's the art form. To be able to go out there without that prejudice, without knowledge, really knowledge, you have to go on another kind of sense, spider sense, and also all the knowledge that you've practiced your instrument, you have your skill, and um, then you have to breathe deep and let it rela- relax and find the moment. And it's the moment that you're after. And science, it, science really doesn't really play into that you know i mean you you know you look at your stick you think of your breathing yes you know that breathing has to be a you know in a certain regular pattern in order for you to be relaxed and you know the stick has to come back at a certain velocity and in a speed and but i think that when the music stops and i can see it all in perspective that's where the science comes in for me i go wow okay that's what it so that's why I did that. But I don't think about it when I'm when I'm doing it. That would put me out of the now. Yeah, put me out of the moment. Yeah, you can't think. Thinking uh, gives you too much of a um, we call a latency. Mm-hmm. You're behind 
a few milliseconds. If you're behind eight milliseconds, you're gone. You're, hi you're history. Anything more than eight, nine milliseconds, you're in trouble. Do you find that there's a, a different vibe with the original lineup and then maybe corresponding lineups to the lineup you have today? Of course. Like, of like course. what's the, is, can you put words telepathy. to it? Telepathy. Telepathy. Yeah. That's the one word that comes to mind. Because we were telepathic. Remember, we went out on stage without a set list or anything. We never talked about it or anything. We just went out there and started playing. Wound up hours later. You can't do that with this band. Huh. This band isn't telepathic. I mean, we, we were in the groove for so many years, so many hours. We practiced thousands of hours before we hit the stage. It's just to forget everything and be able to come up with something hopefully creatively new. I mean, O'Teal and Jeff Cimenti and John Mayer, as good as they are, can only be so much, so just so telepathic. You know, it's, they can't be as, as uh, immersed in dead music as, as the three of us are now. Are there moments when you're on stage and you're about to start a big tour tomorrow, right? For the 2018 Dead and Company tour. Are there moments that you've played with these other guys on stage where you do have that? Oh, yeah. Oh, very much so. A yeah. lot of them. What a lot of tele telepathic. Can you describe that a little bit? Well, that means when you're all moving together and, uh, and you're in sync. It's the big word is sync. In, or um, entrainment is a better word. Rhythmic entrainment. If you're in training with someone, you're in the groove, as they say, or in rhythm or together in the moment, That's that happens to us all the time. In the beginning, it was deeper. Remember, we were taking psychoactive drugs at the time. So well, that and you made were a, 18. a very incredible connection. I was young. You guys grew up together. That's right. We lived together. When you were with Jerry on stage, so we, he could follow me. I could follow him. We could play. We could go together, and we could split up. We could play games. We played rhythm games all the time. It was it was totally amusing, profound and amusing. And so, and it was entertaining as well. And it was a physical journey, a mental journey. That just takes thousands and thousands of hours to do, get to that place. You know, it, th there's no other way to do it, to be able to conjure that kind of a magical connection. And that's what we have. But is that the know. goal now? Or is it? do you have another goal now with these, with these new players? Oh, is, it's always the goal. It's always the goal? Always the goal. Is that's, that, the, it, that's the grail, man. That's what you're after. That's the, you, when you ring the bell. Magic. The M word. If you get, have magic, you have it all. You have everything. So you don't know how it happens. But you know it when it happens. You get magic at every show now. We can't have it every show, a bit of it, yes. Uh, that's how you tell a show. You have more or less of it. Sometimes there's more magic. Sometimes it goes the whole show. Sometimes it's fleeting. Sometimes you're there and you lose it. And then you get it back again. Do then you, you lose sense? it again and then get it back. Do you sense magic with other people mm -hmm. when you're not in the magic? Yes. Very good question. You can hear the interplay. See, it's a conversation. Everybody's conversing. Bob is talking to John, I'm talking to Jeff, and I'm talking to Bill, and I'm talking, and they're talking to that guy, and then, but we all hear each other's conversation. We can chime in at any time. Uh, if you have freedom in the music, and that's the other thing, freedom, big part of music. If you have freedom, then you can really explore the inner space. It's about musical freedom, it's about how much you allow yourself, or other people allow you, or you allow other people to go in and out of the code, the musical code of the moment, which is always code. But you can have issues. Oh, all the time. There's a, we have arguments, we disagreements. Sometimes they go into arguments, but mostly they're just minor disagreements, and then we correct them. And then you, you agree. Or and you, then we agree again. And then you we agree go, to disagree? It's a, Mm, yes, sometimes. But normally we're trying to find some resonance, yeah. which is another big word, resonance. In, entrainment and resonance. Big words in music, in how, life. How much of it is, is, is seeing each other compared to listening to each other? It's, it's a combination of seeing and, uh, seeing and hearing. You put two of those senses together and you've got some power. I mean, if you don't see somebody... You can play with them, but the connection isn't as strong. Once you get in the groove, the groove is kind of like a vessel, and it takes you. 
to different places. You could travel together. Think of it as a travelogue kind of. That's the way I think of music. I get up there and I wind up someplace else. And along the way, I see the sights and I hear the see the sights and I hear the sounds. If we can all enjoy them together for most of the night, we walk off with a smile. If not, we don't. In the old days, when we couldn't do that, it was suicidal. That's how serious it becomes. Why do you mean by that? Well, if you can't accomplish music, which is such an important and immediate thing, it's it's so integral to everything, your happiness, to your well-being, other people's well-being, audiences' well-being, mental health. If you fail at that, you fail at everything, your mission in life, you know? And so we never talk about it. We never talked about it. It's always silent. We don't say much about the performances at all. Nobody blames. You see, that's always the thing about the Grateful Dead. We never blamed it. One day, we said, Bob, okay. We were rehearsing, and Bob did this lick, and said, okay, Bob, you do that lick, and then we'll do this lick, and, and everything will happen after that, but you've got to remember, do that. And, of course, Bob forgot. <laughs> and and then, so afterwards, we got on Bob, right. and said, Bob, what'd you do? You should have done that. And then we realized right then, somebody said, you know, if we want to play forever, we can't do this. Yeah. We can't blame anybody for anything. Mm. It's not a blame sport. It's not like that. There's no blame here. We're all in it together. And we'll work it out. And so we never blame. <laughs> and that's how we were able to last. That was one of the big secrets of not throwing shade, as they say. Was there a big learning curve for you playing with these new fellas when you first started playing with them, with the Dead, Dead and Company? Like, what was the, well, what was yes the challenge no. for you? Yes and no. There was a certain kind of a synchrony that was automatic from the moment. I didn't know the music, but that was secondary to the feeling. It was kind of like a slipstream. Think of it in those terms. It's kind of like a um, tractor beam. You know, once the beam is formed, it's very hard to break out. I mean, as long as you stay within the uh, proximity of everybody and you can see and hear everybody and you are active in that, you're there. You just have to stay there long enough to enjoy it. You can't go over the line into trance too much because then you lose your facility. But we're trance dancers. That's what we do. We sell trance. It's basic, the bottom line. And trance is a tricky thing. First of all, you gotta find the trance, and then you gotta hold the trance. And if you go over the line, you become in trance, and therefore, you're not the trancer, you're the trancee. There are a lot of things to learn about trance, and Grateful Dead is trance band. You sell trance. By the pound. <laughs> all right. You really have been trance shaman in a while, for a while. Well, we're sort of seat of the pants kind of shaman. shaman seat of the pants, say, yeah, trance. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, so with all shamanisms, you know, right back, you know, to the first shaman, whoever he may have been. It's music magic, and it's also medicinal in many ways because as you feel, to get that feeling of well-being, you go for more, 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 more. It's insatiable. You can get drunk on it. You well, on, it's on the it. dopamine. It's the same stuff. Well, dopamine, of course. You're firing. I don't care yeah. if it's music or LSD or anything in between. Correct. Correct. Sometimes it's running, which I don't do enough of. Uh, even as a musician who practices it, I don't do it enough. Right. I, I just, because music makes me whole. Without music, I'm not me. If I don't play music, I can't be the best version of me. It came to me last night because I hadn't played in the band for a while. We've been off the road for a while. But, you know, I'll go two, three, four, five, six, I go 10 hours some days. It's not the same as that transfer of energy when you play live in the moment. 
It's Chuck from Above the Basement, Boston Music and Conversation. How would you like to join us in creating great conversations that inspire and connect? Patreon is a membership platform that provides a way for creators like us to build relationships and provide exclusive experiences to subscribers or patrons. We have been self-financed since we got off the ground in June of 2016, but in order to continue to fully invest all we can in each episode, we need your patronage. For more information, please go to patreon.com forward slash above the basement. If you have any more questions, I'm okay with it. Yeah. I feel very enthused and energetic now about this conversation. If there are any places yeah. you want to go, go there. We wanted to talk about Alzheimer's. Isn't that where we were going? I did want to talk about that as a treatment because you mentioned the tonic of music that can really change people as medicine. And they don't have to be unhealthy. They can be anybody in this room. And how do we channel that like mindfulness? So how is music for our health? It's a big question, I know, I know, um, but music, is a, know music is a tuning system. You have to look at it as a tool. It's a tuning system. That's how we tune the body, because the body is made up of rhythms. We are multidimensional rhythm machines embedded in a universe of rhythm. And once you get that vibration and that impulse, you are tuning your, your body and your mind. Your mind and your body are now connected. And once that connection is made, you're healthy. You know, you're healthier. You keep those health rhythms going, and good life, good rhythm. Bad rhythm, bad life. War, bad rhythm. Health, good rhythm. Peace, good rhythm. So if you see the world in rhythmic terms, it's pretty easy. What's you know? really wild, though, is the what you call in medicine is efferent and afferent, right? So it's the afferent that comes to somebody, the efferent that comes away. So your blood comes up, your afferent, or your nervous system, your efferent goes out. Well, Remove. that's where science helps because now you understand where, you're, where the impetus is coming from. What, you, what you're really doing is connecting to the world around you, all of the other rhythms in the, in the universe. But the treatment is efferent. So the treatment is what you've been doing for your whole career right. with trance. And I think one of the amazing things about this day and age is how, we all have to prove stuff. So how, how do we, as you know, scientists, a lot of people much smarter than me, how, how do we actually show that you're making outcomes change by certain types of rhythm and melodies on, off, like a drug. How do you give it like a pill? We're well, not there there's yet. a couple of ways. First of all, you have to think of the ease of it all, that you're not working to make it happen. Then you have to look at the people around you that are being affected by it. Once you see this go, once you see this happen in the audience, then you know you're getting closer, and then you keep going, and then all of a sudden this whole corpus, this whole body is one, so the idea is to form a loop between them and you where you give it to them and then they give it back to you and then you give it back to them and you all night this works and once you can once you have that loop then you know you've got it i had a dear friend and i'm I'm sure you know who he is his name is walter cronkite and walter we were friends for like 25 years really good friends and walter turned out to be a a drummer He, he loved playing hand drums at the beginning, he would say, oh, Mickey, how do I know when I have... Because I told him about the groove. He said, how do I know when I get the groove, you know, when I have that? I said, Walter, I, I, Walter, you'll, you'll know when you get the groove. So when Walter, he was a rhythm, superb rhythmist. I mean, think, listen to the way he spoke, the way he moved. He was a voice shaman, and that was music. So we were playing... I had him up on stage once in New York City and behind me. He would play a drum sometimes. And, and I'd be playing, and all of a sudden he said, I hear Mickey, Mickey. And I look around, he says, I've got it. I've got it. I've got the groove. Oh and I said, yeah, Rolando, you got it. He said, I know. It's the, I got the groove. And I said, yeah, hold it, Walter. Hold on to it. And while we were all playing, this was going down. And Walter played almost to the day he died. I was with him, and he was playing... A hand drum, almost the day he died. I would love to have seen video of him behind yeah, yeah. you playing. <laughs> yeah, that well, there is some amazing. video of us in private. You know, we have you know private video. There is shots of us playing together. But um, was was Walter Cronkite a, a big Dead fan? You didn't know about the Grateful Dead. He didn't have any idea about popular music. He never was to a concert, a popular music concert. He never was to Madison Square Garden. He never went to any of that. He was a classical guy. He loved Mormon Tabernacle Choir. He loved Dixieland. But 
And rock and roll was off the, off the charts. He liked big band and so forth. But uh, I met Walter. Well, I did the uh, America's Cup, 1987 America's Cup, which he was the voice of the America's Cup. And that's how we met. I did the score for that. And uh, we became friends that day. And then it went on from there. And then I brought him to Madison Square Garden. I said, Walter, I'd like you to hear what I do. I mean, I just don't do movie scores. I, I play rock and roll. And He met you with Apocalypse Now? No, it was later. That was Apocalypse in 79. I don't know when it I met him. It was 87. When you said movie score, I don't know if that no, was No, I do movies. I did Apocalypse. But this was a TV thing. And so I brought him to Madison Square Garden. I had a solver out there for him and a couple of guards by the, uh, by the sound booth. And he came back halftime. And him and his wife, Betsy, beautiful, 65 years, they were married. And he said, you know, like, I was thinking of all the different reasons, uh, excuses to leave, you know, here at halftime. And he said, you know, now I can't think of one. <laughs> and he said, this music really gets to you, doesn't it? I said, yeah, Walter, it really yeah. does get to you. And so he went backstage <laughs> and he had a, drink, had a glass of wine with Jerry. You see Jerry and Walter toasting. We were all Walter, big Walter friends, you know. I mean, well, everybody's a Walter, for, you know, a Walter guy. Yeah, we heard what he did for years, and finally he, he, he went to your workplace. Oh, he went to my workplace. He had a blast, and then we played together. He came on stage a few times. I had to keep, you know, I keep him undercover, so. But uh, I, I gave him, they always give him the option. I said, Walter? I used to talk to him in the Walter voice. I said, Walter, <laughs> you could sit in the audience or... Uh, and drum, I'll put a little space over there, and you can have your drum play, or you can come on stage with me. And he said, oh, I'm with you. Here we go, I'm with you. <laughs> and I go, good. okay, Walter, come on up. And uh, that's, how, that was how we, that's how we rolled. It was uh, walking down the street with Walter, like Mutt and Jeff, you know. Drum for the Grateful Dead. Walter Cronkite. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like some dream. I love it. <laughs> it's like a weirdest dream. Yeah. We just clicked. He asked me out to dinner. He said, hungry? Yeah. Let's have some dinner. And that's where it started. That's fascinating. I can't believe that he was playing with you. That's amazing. What did you have for dinner with Walter Cronkite? <laughs> well, we like, we like Italian food. We like steaks. It's hard to be in a restaurant with Walter because, you know, we walk, you walk into the restaurant with Walter, the whole restaurant goes silent, you know. And <laughs> they listen to our conversation because we're both hard of hearing and we always speak loud. And we don't give a shit. You know, we just spoke. We didn't care who was around. We were just, and we were always yelling at each other, you know, because before, that's before I got Walter's earpiece. And then he finally was able to hear well. You know, he was getting up there. and Yeah, but that's the way it was with Walter in a restaurant. But all kinds of crazy people would come up to give him, pay homage to yeah, him, right. you know, and thanks to right. him. All kinds. He said, who is that? I said, that, he said, that's one of the most beautiful women in the world, Walter. Oh. You know, when Miss America came up, uh, you know, all these different people would come up. He, said, he wasn't into pop culture. He didn't really know about that. That was not one of his things. Neither were you, in a sense. Not really. I knew about rock and roll. I didn't, I didn't know anything about classical music. I mean, I played Copeland in high school. You know, I played all of that stuff. That's about as far as I got. I went to uh, you know a few symphonies, you know, the Ring and so forth, but it never rung my bell. As a after this tour, what's what's next for you? What's next? Well, there'll be uh, with Renee Fleming. There'll be um, music in the mind in Washington D.C. Two days at the Kennedy Center, seventh and eighth. That's one thing that's happening. And then I have personal explorations that I uh, and research that I'm doing on. The life of plants and trees and sonifications of the uh, natural world. Your book? Uh, There'll be a book, probably. Yeah, probably down the road. Yeah, once I, once I immerse myself in all this enough that I think I could, see, my my spin is rhythm. You know, there's been a lot of books written on plants and all of that stuff, but it's the rhythm that I'm interested in, the rhythm of the natural world. So that's where my my study is, from the micro, you know, down to the micro, from the macro to the micro. There's rhythm. Without it, there is no life. So you have to have rhythm. Now, how you nurture and cultivate that rhythm is how well you go through life. And that's the bottom line. The rhythm stop, you die. You know, and that's what happens. My grandmother was advanced Alzheimer's, and uh, she didn't speak for years. And then I uh, played a drum for her. I was in the car. It was me and her. I had always had a drum in the car in those days. And so I had a little hand drum, and I played it for her. 
and for about 10 minutes, I, we were sitting someplace by a, a cliff lo- overlooking the ocean or something. And I, took, I used to take it for rides, and, and she spoke my name. And that is when I realized music and medicine. And that was the moment that I said, oh my goodness, this unlocked her speech. She was able to reconnect just for a moment. She said my, my name a few times, never spoke again. But she did speak. And that was the catalyst. That was for all of my work as far as in in the medicinal side, music is medicine and music is therapy. And then I went in front of Harry Reid's subcommittee. I testified in front of the Senate in 1991 on his commission on aging, subcommittee on aging. Oliver, me and Oliver went. Oliver Sachs. Yeah, Oliver Sachs. And Harry Reid gave us over a million dollars for music therapy. It was very visionary for him to do that. And we distributed it to the music therapists and kind of kick-started it here in the West. And so that was the trail, the beginning of the, mu- the trail of music medicine was with Harry and with Oliver. I work with a lot of music therapists, actually, at an organization called the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine. That was sort of the big bang for music therapy. Yeah. So thank you for well, triggering some of that, yeah. not only... Well, now what's happening is now we're, giving, now we're giving all of them the science of it. So you think right. of the music therapist as an army. You know, you got to think of them as an army out there who are well-meaning, and, but they can't repeat. When you're a music therapist, if you don't have the science behind it, you know, and music is like that. You can't right. necessarily right. repeat. If you can't repeat, it's not science, okay? It's philosophy, and it's only a lot of other things, you know, if you can't do it in a laboratory. It's all anecdotal. But it works sometimes. So by giving these music therapists their marching orders, by giving them the science, now you have an army of music therapists that really know what they're doing and that's what's happening now and they have an artistic side to them that can actually with marching orders can bring out different things in different people correct because before i was seated the pants you know when i did something and something happened when i was at with oliver at the institute of music uh, neurologic function and did drum circles with the drum experiences you'd see amazing things people playing you know who haven't even moved and they are able to shake their hands or their feet or come alive at least for the time during the uh, experience auditory driving experience then you'd follow them back into the wards and slowly they would drift back Mm -hmm. watching you know looking at the fish tanks and looking out the windows and they would go back into the loneliness and uh, then I began working started working with uh, the the autistic and that was the biggest challenge because as you know the autistic they they don't like loud sounds they don't like transients they don't like sharp sounds, they don't like loud sounds, and they're the fur- furthest out, the hardest to reach. And so I designed drums that had only low-end frequency response, and they were attracted to that. And they thought of it as their first friend they ever had, or a heartbeat, and so they started connecting. So you have to find instruments that appeal to the certain kind of dysfunction Zildjian does home. that with the cymbals now. Zildjian, which is right here in town. Right, I know. Norwood I know Zildjian yeah. since 67. I, Are know, you I knew the grandfather, the old man. You know Craigie then? I knew Avidus. No, I went back to the, 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 their father. Zildjian's the oldest Avidus. company. Avidus, he signed my cymbal. I still have that cymbal. So I didn't, actually, I did some... They, they don't little, even know it, but I have on you, Mickey, but I didn't know that you were a Zildjian. Oh, they had it. They were in a garage. They were just like a two-car garage in Quincy, Mass., I believe it was. So they're the oldest company in the United States. In the 16 world. 16 in the world. In the world. But anyway, they have some amazing symbols that are, as you know, that are low, of low frequency. Very beautiful. I mean... Uh, I got to tell Craigie that we... Uh, Craigie! Might- Say hello to her for me. Of course. Give her a big hello. I haven't seen her in years. Craigie's the president of Zildjian now. Craigie Zildjian. That's a granddaughter of yeah, Vitas. Right. Yeah. I don't even know she knew her grandfather. Great grandfather. Yeah, what was his name again? I got her. A Vitas. Oh, a Vitas. Okay. Yeah, of course. A Zildjian. Okay, and they had two sons. One of them went up to, Bob went up to uh, Canada and made Z- Sabian. Oh, and right. Armand Sabian. Came down here. Armand, Armand came down here and made uh, Zildjians. The same formula. They had a falling out in the family. They don't make gongs. They make cymbals. We need a gong for the podcast. Uh, I don't know if it's in the budget. Remember the gong show? Of course. Chuck Barris, right? Yeah, Chuck. I mean, he was... He was a gong. He was a gong gong. CIA dude. (laughs) Right. So you got a rehearsal? Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) I guess you call it a rehearsal. Um, I, I'm already rehearsed, but I'll, yeah, I'll, go and warm, right. I'll warm that, up. Warm up. Yeah, let's say it's a musical get together. It's go. a get together. Yeah, rehearse is a funny word. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know where that came from. Where did that come from, rehearsal? Okay, find out for me. Give me, a, <laughs> give me 25 words on it. Give me 2,500 <laughs> words on that. Yeah. No, rehearsal. She's on it. Berkeley's it's, it's on a, it. It's a playing. It's a playing, which you're in real time. You're not supposed to be doing things you've done before, except you have to honor the form. When you play, you have to be consciously um, creative. Rehearsal seems to be like more like a re recreational word, a recreational word, as opposed to a creational word, yeah. which is playing. Uh, that's the way I like to look at them, you know, because rehearsals sound boring. It does. And they sound Let's like... skip it. Oh, I don't want to rehearse. I never want to rehearse. I just want to play. I have a, the online etymology dictionary. It's from 1300 to give account of from Anglo-French rehearser. To go over again, repeat. Literally to rake over, to turn over soil or ground. Really? Mm. Yeah, that sounds pretty boring to me. Well, they're talking yeah. in musicological terms. In rehearsal, there should be a creative spark. Yeah. You know, I think there will so be. So you should be in a creational mode as a recreational mode. I can't imagine you in any other kind of mode. Do not take it for granted. It's not always like that. It's just like in li anything in life, sometimes you just don't feel like doing it. Or your mind is somewhere else and you can't get it off of where it is. And you go onto the stage and then you're just, you're just operating on fumes. That's the worst feeling. But you have to go through the motions because you're practicing, always practicing. Everybody practices till the day they die. So you got to practice, yeah. always. I'd rather play than practice, but I have to practice. Mm -hmm. Practice seems just playing over the same thing. What's the so, etymology of practice? Yeah, go, right. I get, guess. Okay, what is it? <laughs> Danny's on it, man. No, I want to know. A sense of practice a play part. So it comes from, it's to say over again, repeat as been already said or written. See, from, that's it. Practice from the theater. Is it repeating? Yeah. And you have to repeat. In order to learn, you have to come to grips with the rhythmic patterns and so forth and have them instilled in you where you don't have to think. Exactly. Yeah, so it's, that's really important practice. I practice. That's what they say in acting. You say you learn your lines and then you forget them. Once you learn well, them, once you them, practice them, then you can forget them. Right, exactly. You know, and then if you've practiced enough and you've done the correct amount of assimilation right. of that data, you shouldn't have to think about it. Exactly. That's when you it can should turn be it off. in an innate. I can, you can be the empty yeah. vessel you want to be on your That's what I go after. It's That's always been that way. Band. It's always been that way. Empty vessels? It has always been that way. It's always been that <laughs> way. There's a certain kind of joy that you have to bring to music, to the stage, in order to get it back. You can't go up there just blank. As I said, that was a misnomer. You can't go blank. You have to bring a certain kind of emotion with you. You don't have to think, but you have to have emotional content in order to play music or else... You know, he'd be a stick, you know, an inanimate thing or something. You have to be alive in order to be able to make the music alive. Or else it's, it's just notes on a sheet of paper. If you don't bring those notes to life, then you're in a recreational mode. Like a lot, a lot of classical musicians, some very well-known classical musicians, really some of the best, can't play a lick without it being written. I won't not mention names, but it's a thing. I couldn't believe it when yeah. this one person it's a different the, skill. is the best at what he does, a classical musician. He asked me to teach him how to jam. When you have both, it is unbelievable. Unbelievable. In jazz, in some forms of classical, it's crazy. The mind is jazz. You know, the mind is an improvisational unit, and it's jazz. You know, that's what it does. It makes up its mind, and it's spontaneous, and it reacts really quickly, and improvises. And that's what jazz is all about. So if you look at the mind in those kind of terms, as a, in rhythmic terms, you're playing jazz. You're jazz. If you're working right, you're jazz. And one thing leads to another, and the more you know, the easier it is to go to the next place in improvisation, right? I like that. The mind is jazz. It's true. F read the book, Physics of Jazz. We know you got to get going soon, Mickey. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks a lot for waking me up.
If you did not hear part one, go to AboveTheBasement.com, where you can also join us on Patreon. Sign up for our newsletter, listen and subscribe to our podcast, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, and look at all the nice pictures we post on Instagram. We are everywhere. On behalf of Ronnie and myself, thanks for listening. Tell your friends, and remember, Boston music, like its history, is unique. <laughs>